Finally! This is it. Part 5 of the Alabaster Arc Review. Episodes 125 to 130. Miss Father's Day and Mr. Seven are preparing to ignite the cannon. Nobby gets this brilliant idea of how she's gonna get Vivi to the top of the tower. Usopp, Chopper, and Vivi all stack on top of each other. Cyclone Tempo them up to Sanji, who launches Vivi and Chopper up higher with a super kick. Then Zoro launches them higher. Chopper distracts Mr. Seven and Miss Father's Day as Vivi attacks. She cuts the wick, but the bomb has a timer on it. What the hell? 30 seconds. Suddenly Pell appears and has all these flashbacks about how much he loves Alabasta. This is no time for flashbacks, Pell. Pell grabs the bomb and flies up into the air. And the bomb explodes! Pell! <sighs> Meanwhile, Crocodile heard the explosion and he assumes that means he won. Especially since Luffy's barely able to move because of the poison. But then Luffy stands up. You can't defeat me! Why won't you die? Luffy punch! Luffy punches Crocodile so hard that he flies through the bedrock and high up into the air. Luffy wins! The rebels see it happen, but they keep fighting. Then Koza suddenly dives out with his arm outstretched. It's raining. Everyone stands in awe together. Then Chaka appears, imploring the rebels not to fight anymore. Then Igaram appears with a small child from many episodes ago. The child exposits on the truth of the king's attack on Nanohana. It was Mr. Two the whole time. Crocodile lands in the middle of the square and Toshigi and the rest of the marines strip Crocodile of his Shichibukai title and arrest him. Meanwhile, the Mugiwara crew stumbles across the king carrying an unconscious Luffy. Don't worry, he took an antidote for the poison. The crew tells the king and Vivi to go address their people. And then they all pass out in the street from exhaustion. The king tells his people that they must be strong and stand upon this war. Cue the weep fest! Tashigi decides not to arrest the Mugiwara crew and heads back to Smoker expecting to be punished. But he tells her to stop crying and get stronger. He's teamed up with this woman named Hina. She ate the Ori Ori fruit so everything she touches becomes locked up. Turns out Smoker and Tashigi are getting the credit for defeating Crocodile and saving Alabasta. Smoker's response to the accompanying promotion? Eat shit! Oh, Smoker. Meanwhile, the Mugiwara crew is resting at the palace. Luffy finally wakes up after three days. Igaram's crazy looking wife serves them food. And then they have hilarious adventures in the bathhouse. Then Igaram discovers that Luffy's new bounty is a hundred million! Zoro also has a bounty for defeating Mr. One, who is apparently a big deal bounty hunter. Then they get a call from Mr. Two, who still remembers their friendship all the way back to episode 92. He has been keeping their ship safe from the marines. The crew has to go, but Vivi doesn't know if she should stay and be a princess or go with them and be a pirate. The crew will swing by at noon tomorrow and pick her up if she decides to come along. That time directly conflicts with the speech Vivi has to make for her coming of age ceremony. After the crew leaves, she has a favor to ask of Igaram. Meanwhile, the crew meets up with Mr. Two on the Going Merry. But the Marines arrive and Mr. Two tells them to escape. They can't because they promised they would meet up with Vivi. Mr. Two is so inspired that he agrees to be a decoy. The Marines fall for it and follow Mr. Two's ship. What an amazing and dramatic blaze of glory. Redemption. Anyway, the crew is at the meeting spot, but it seems like Vivi stayed for the speech. Wait, that's Igaram dressed up as Vivi. She came to the shore after all. She decided to be a pirate. No, she only came to say goodbye. She can't come with them because she loves Alabasta too much, but she asks that if they ever meet again, could they still call her their Nakama. The crew silently punches the air, showing off the mark of the Nakama as a wholehearted yes. Okay, now they have to escape. We get a quick wrap up of what all the characters in Alabaster are doing. Chaka puts flowers on Pell's grave. The fake rebels protect the same town. The sand pirates seem to be doing fine. And the Yuba Oasis is thriving. And Koza is finally smiling. The Kung Fu Dugongs keep practicing. The giant crab battles a giant scorpion. Eyelashes the camel joins the duck squad. And Smoker and Tashiki will continue to pursue the Mugiwara crew. And Pell is alive? How? 
Anyway, the Mogiwara crew manages to escape the Marines. When suddenly, Nico Robin reveals herself. Casually, she tells Luffy to let her join the crew. He saved her life when she wanted to die, so therefore, he owes her. That makes perfect sense to Luffy, so he says okay. She still has to win over the rest of the crew, though. So Usopp conducts a job interview. What is your name? Nico Robin, archaeologist, former member of the Baroque's works and various other evil organizations. What is your quest? To obtain the true history located on the Rio Poneglyph. What is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? Uh, here's some money. Nami's won over! Usopp and Chopper are won over by her awesome devil fruit abilities. Sanji is of course won over because he's in love. Zoro is the only one left skeptical of Robin's intentions. And thus the Alabasta arc is concluded. Big events! New crew member, Robin! And we lost a crew member, Vivi. Also there's a new ending theme that I haven't mentioned before, but it's been around for a while. Luffy's bounty went up and Zoro got a bounty. All in all, what can I say? How can you not like a happy ending? Even if it was a little too happy. But they definitely successfully manipulated my emotions very well at the end there. A scene in One Piece hasn't made me cry yet, but it was very close. An excellent arc drawn to a complete end. Okay, and Crocodile. He was barely in that chunk, actually. I figured out why I don't think Crocodile is as good as a villain as Arlong is. Arlong's reasoning for what he was doing was that he believed his race was superior, so therefore they deserved anything they gained. But Crocodile's reasoning? Eh, he just felt like it. Sure, there was that thing about the weapon Pluton, but that was just an extra perk. It's not how evil they act, but it's the terrible truth behind their evil behavior that makes a villain so compelling. To me, Crocodile just seemed like a dick who happened to have powers he chose to abuse. If Crocodile didn't have sand powers, he would just be the office asshole that no one liked. And that, my friends, is why Crocodile didn't do it for me. However, Luffy and Crocodile had a really great conversation. Crocodile asks Luffy why he would die for someone else's desire. And Luffy's response is so simple and absolutely perfect. If I abandon Vivi, she'll die and I don't want her to die, so I can't abandon Vivi. I mean, obviously, duh, but that isn't something Crocodile can actually understand. And he's further confused when Luffy takes his simplicity even a step beyond. You can't defeat me, so therefore, I will surpass you. There it is. If X, then Y. That's all there is to it. You gotta love Luffy. Also, let's address Mr. Two's turnaround. Cute! It was sweet to bring their friendship back and give Mr. Two this random, honorable character trait. Turns out he probably wasn't evil the whole time, just drawn to power. In this case, the person who had the most power was Crocodile, so he joined the Baroque works. Now Luffy is the most powerful, so his loyalties switch. And that's all. Finally, how about Pell's relationship to Vivi and his subsequent sacrifice for Alabasta? It was weird because I felt like at first it kind of came out of nowhere. But then, okay, you think back to all the things that you've seen Pell already do for Alabasta, and yeah, it makes sense. I like how in the flashback, Pell was more of a father than Vivi's actual father. While the king was right there, Pell took it upon himself to discipline Vivi physically. That says a lot about how close they were and how much the king trusted him. It also makes me think that Pell carried the bomb away to rescue Vivi rather than rescue Alabasta. At last, some awards. Honorable mention is obviously Pell. The best pair is Mr. Two and himself. The best bird is definitely the manner in which Smoker decided to turn down his promotion. The triumphant moment was when Crocodile was flying through the air and the silence that ensued. WTF is why and how is Igaram alive? No explanation offered and no injuries to show. The lol is Igaram's ridiculous wife. The tearjerker was really hard to choose. It was totally Pell's sacrifice until he was suddenly alive. So let's go at the end when everyone showed off their mark of the Nakama. Best fight, of course, is Luffy versus Crocodile. It was also the only fight. And the MVP is the man himself, Luffy. Oh, Alabasta arc. So long and so over.
You guys have all discouraged me strongly against watching the upcoming filler arcs. So my next video about One Piece will jump right into the next arc after the three filler arcs, and it's called the Jaya arc. It's nine episodes long. I'll examine four episodes, then watch one, and then examine four more. But before I do that, I'm thinking I should do a retrospective and look at the Alabasta arc as a whole. Because I looked at it in pieces, but I haven't really, really looked at it as one big arc. I maybe pit all of the awards against each other. That might be fine, guys. Anyway, I'll see you next time regardless. Bye-bye! What an amazing battle of... What? Smoker's response to the... <laughs> I'm just so excited about this line. Smoker's response to the accompanying from a fish. Cyclone, temple them up to Sanji. Temple. What is the airspeed velocity... <laughs> what is the airspeed velocity... <laughs> this is too much work for just a stupid joke.